Hi everyone. Before I get into today's topic, if you notice my shirt, it says, ask smart people stupid questions. And if you know where that's from, podcast ologies, good for you. And if you don't know where that's from, you totally should listen to the podcast ologies. It's amazing. It makes science fun and hilarious and so interesting and amazing. Anyway, tangents aside, let's get into today's topic. Oxygen isotopes, specifically stable oxygen isotopes and how we can use stable isotopes as a whole to study past environment and past climate conditions. So before I get into the nitty gritty mechanisms that oxygen isotopes under go in the physical environment, we're going to start with some isotopic basics. If you don't remember from the absolute dating episode, isotopes are an atom of the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. For this reason, we write isotopes in a specific notation that indicates the number of protons plus neutrons so that we know which one has more or less neutrons. For example, with oxygen isotopes, the most naturally abundant oxygen isotope, which accounts for nearly 99.8% of all oxygen on Earth, is oxygen-16. And so we know that 16 is the number of protons plus neutrons, and we know it has to have eight protons because the number of protons defines an element and that cannot change or else the element changes. So if we know it has eight protons and 16 is the number of protons plus neutrons, then it must have eight neutrons as well. Likewise, oxygen-17 must have eight protons and nine neutrons, and oxygen-18 must have eight protons and ten neutrons, and so on with every other element's isotopes. So now that we have that out of the way, we can see that oxygen-18 and oxygen-16 are the most abundant stable isotopes of oxygen, and therefore we use the ratio of oxygen-18 to 16 to study oxygen isotopes and their movement throughout different systems on Earth. The reason we don't study oxygen-17 in stable isotope geochemistry is because there's so little oxygen 17 in the natural environment that it's just really hard to detect and it's just way easier to measure 18 to 16 ratios. And in stable isotope geochemistry, you will see throughout this video as well as the other stable isotope videos I do that we always take the ratio of heavy to light isotope, never light over heavy, always heavy over light. And the reason we call it heavy and light isotopes is just because neutrons add a lot of weight to a nucleus because neutrons, even though they're tiny, for atoms, they're quite significant in terms of changing the mass, especially for light isotopes. Meaning if you have an isotope of hydrogen and it typically has one proton and one electron, no neutrons, and then you add a neutron to make it deuterium, which we'll see in the next slide, this doubles its mass. And the physical way it moves around different systems in the environment changes a lot. But if you have something like uranium-238 and then you add or take away a couple neutrons, it's like, all right, that wasn't that bad. So it may not change physically in the same way that something like light isotopes would. And that's why we're going to be focusing on light stable isotopes because the physical differences in their masses is significant enough to cause them to behave differently in the environment. And we'll see that with oxygen in a few slides. But first, let me just show you with a graphic what these isotopes really do have. So we can see here the isotope hydrogen, one proton and one electron, is the most abundant hydrogen isotope. And then deuterium has one proton and one neutron. And the electrons aren't shown here. We're just showing the changes to the nuclei of the atoms. So then when we look at the stable isotopes of oxygen, which is the topic of this video, we can see that the nucleus here has eight protons and eight neutrons. And if you see the oxygen 18 isotope of that, it has two extra neutrons. And so I put a star under each neutron number here to show once again, that is what is changing. And once again, I will point out that the mass is changing because of the added neutrons. This becomes important when we look at how oxygen isotopes become incorporated into different systems in the natural environment. Oxygen isotopes are going to fractionate during evaporation processes from the ocean. And this means that when evaporation occurs from the ocean or any water body from that matter, the oxygen that is in the water molecule can either be light or heavy. And so that evaporation is going to favor taking up the light isotope or the water molecules that have oxygen 16 in them rather than 18, creating a more oxygen 16 enriched and 18 depleted pool of oxygen isotopes in the clouds and 
opposite to that, when things precipitate out of the clouds, the precipitation is going to favor the heavy isotope. And so that precipitation is going to be enriched in oxygen 18 relative to that of 16. And all these processes that favor one isotope over the other, that's just called fractionation. The isotopes are becoming fractionated during those processes. And this fractionation we can measure, we can track, not only through different environments on Earth today, but also through time. But before we talk about that, let's get into the nitty gritty of how these things move around. We talked about evaporation and precipitation, but think about different climates now. For example, if you have a cold climate, it's not going to be warm enough to evaporate hardly any oxygen 18. It's going to do mostly 16. And then the rain from those really isotopically light clouds is going to even further fractionate the clouds, meaning that it's going to even further deplete it in 18. And it's going to make it lighter and lighter. And as those clouds migrate to the poles, the ice sheets and glaciers are going to become super light in oxygen isotopes and the water and the oceans are going to become super heavy or enriched in oxygen 18 during these cold climatic periods. However, if you have a warm climate, it will be warm enough to evaporate out more oxygen 18 from the oceans and then the clouds will be heavier in their isotopic composition and the ocean will have a lighter oxygen isotopic value than when it's under a cold climate. So just a reiteration of basically the same thing, we just stated a bunch of processes that result in two main rules. The atmospheric rule where if the temperature is higher than the ratio from oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 is also going to be higher, which we write as delta O18. That's what this symbol is in front of the 18O. That is just the ratio of heavy to light isotope. That is also going to be higher or heavier, as we were saying. In the hot climates. And if you remember, that's because more 18 is able to evaporate out of the ocean and become incorporated into the atmosphere in warmer climates. Whereas the opposite is true in cold climates. Less 18 is going to be able to evaporate and it's going to stay back in the ocean and the atmosphere is going to have a lighter isotopic signature. Whereas the oxygen rule is just the opposite. And that is because this is all about interplay between the ocean and atmosphere. Whatever goes into the atmosphere going out of the ocean, whatever comes back into the ocean is going out of the atmosphere. And this is how oxygen isotopes move around. And it all has to do with the fact the mass is different when there are more or less neutrons in the nucleus. One more thing that is really cool we can do with oxygen isotopes rather than just understand temperature is elevation. The reason that we can also use oxygen stable isotopes as an elevation proxy is because the fractionation processes that determine the oxygen isotope ratios in different environments is also governed by increasing altitude and distance from the water source. And that's because after evaporation of occurs from the ocean, those clouds migrate in the weather patterns and predictable directions that we already know. And then as these clouds move further from the water source and higher in altitude, they're going to precipitate out all of their heavy isotopes. By the time they get over that mountain chain or whatever they're migrating up, they're going to be so depleted in oxygen 18 that the signatures up at that altitude are going to be super light, meaning way more oxygen 16 than 18. So those temperature and elevation fluctuations between oxygen ratios are great. But how do we use that as a proxy for ancient environments? Well, it's all in the rocks, my friends. So calcium carbonate, or CaCO3, is a mineral, either aragonite or calcite. They're both the same composition. They just have different crystal structures that typically is used by marine organisms or freshwater organisms to build their skeletons. And this is really important because when they do this, they're building their skeletons with the oxygen isotopes from the water without fractionation. And so this means that their oxygen isotope ratios represent the water that they formed in when they formed formed. So if we measure the oxygen ratios in their shells or skeletons, we immediately have the measurement of the water oxygen isotopes that was there when those animals formed, even though the water's totally gone now. They saved it for us. These incredible organisms aren't even there anymore, but the skeletons they left behind saved the water signatures. And organisms that make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate are, for example, things like sponges and corals, foraminifera and mollusks. And by the way, foraminifera are just 
tiny microscopic organisms like the size of a sand grain. If you can see here, this says 100 micrometers. That's just 0.1 millimeters or 0.01 centimeters. But they are organisms and they do create their tests or skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And then mollusks are snail shells and clam shells. And coccolithophores which are also microscopic, like the foraminifera, but these are actually not microscopic animals. They're microscopic algae. These are plants. And so all of these that I mentioned all make their hard parts out of calcium carbonate. And so we can measure the oxygen isotopes from any one of these. Again, that was corals, sponges, foraminifera, mollusks, and coccolithophores. And I'm sure I'm missing other organisms, but this is just to name a few. And with these organisms, we can create temperature graphs going back to 66 million years ago and longer. But this is just one of the examples. This graph represents temperature spanning from the beginning of the Cenozoic around 66 million years ago to the present going from right to left. And it was made from using oxygen isotopes from from foraminifera, those microfossils I showed you. So we can see here that the warming and cooling trends are in agreement with the decrease and increase of oxygen isotopes respectively. And you might be thinking that, wow, it looks like we've been cooling for a while now. Like there's no global warming. What is, this doesn't make any sense. Well, the only problem here is that these warming and cooling trends happened over a really, 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 really long time. So the scale is really long. It's 66 million years. And we would have to expand the x-axis or the time in order to see our warming trend, which is shown here. This was also determined by oxygen isotopes. And sorry to switch up the time direction on you, but it is going to the right now. And we can now clearly see the warming trend that is contributing to what people are calling global warming. However, if you're wondering, do we only use oxygen isotopes from foraminifera to come up with our paleo temperature estimates? Well, no, we don't. We have so many other proxies, guys. And I'm gonna show you a few in the rest of this video. But if you wanna hear about all of them, you're gonna to have to watch all the stable isotope videos. So we not only use foraminifera for their composition, but also their morphology, which means their shape and structure. Certain species of foraminifera have a peculiar habit of coiling certain directions when they build their tests. And these coil directions have been shown to depend solely on water temperature. Therefore, we can take pretty accurate estimates of water temperature depending on the coil direction of certain species of foraminifera and the known information about what temperature those specific foraminiferan species coil specific directions in. Meaning we can study modern foraminifera species to understand their behavior and the specific temperatures and climate at which they behave certain ways to understand the behavior of of ancient foraminifera of the same species. In addition to oxygen isotopes, though, we can also take carbon isotopes of carbonate material, which foraminifera have in their tests. As we saw, the calcium carbonate, which is CaCO3, has not only O, oxygen, it also has C, carbon. And so for this reason, we can use multiple isotope proxies in carbonate material. In addition to foraminifera, we have other organisms that make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate, like we talked about mollusks and corals, and we can use both carbon and oxygen isotopes from these fossils to reconstruct temperature and climate. And we can use strontium and sulfur isotopes as well. And we'll talk about how we can do that in the strontium and sulfur videos. But this is just to emphasize that we use a lot more than just one proxy to actually interpret paleo temperatures and paleo climate. Additionally, we can become even more specific when we look at mollusks because they grow their shells seasonally, meaning that they have seasonal or annual layers, just like tree rings in a tree. And this allows us to measure temperature variations not only of a specific time period in Earth's history, but also of the seasons of that time period and measure how drastic the changes in the seasons were in the environment that that mollusk was living. In addition to organisms that build their skeletons and hard parts out of calcium carbonate, there are also abiotic processes that can produce calcium carbonate nodules, such as in soils. When rainwater that infiltrates soils evaporates, it can leave behind the soluble minerals in nodule forms, such as seen below, and these carbonate nodules can be preserved in paleosols or ancient fossilized soils, which I have a video about if you want to go watch it. And from these carbonate nodules, we can measure carbon and oxygen isotopes that can provide us additional paleoclimate details, such as the temperature and altitude of the water source and the carbon isotope composition of the atmosphere at that time. But we'll talk more about that in the carbon episode. 
And another thing we can measure oxygen isotopes from that actually isn't calcium carbonate is a mineral called apatite. If you want a specimen of this mineral, you can just look at your own teeth or bones, but you can't really look at your bones, and I don't advise doing that. But we also have in the rock record fossilized teeth, which I would be okay with you looking at. And with these fossilized teeth, we have certain kinds, such as conodonts. These are shown here to the left. These conodonts are pretty useful when we're trying to determine paleoclimate because they're made up of apatite. And apatite is a phosphate mineral, and phosphate has oxygen in it. Additionally, we can use shark teeth for pretty much the same purpose because they're also made up of appetite. And both of these organisms lived in marine or freshwater settings, like everything else we've been talking about. And so when we take the oxygen isotope ratios, we'll be measuring the oxygen isotope ratios of the water that those organisms formed and grew in. Also, we can take oxygen isotopes from things like diatoms. Just like the coccolithophores, diatoms are another group of microscopic algae. However, instead of calcium carbonate, they build their skeletons out of SiO2 or silica, better known as the mineral quartz. Silica has oxygen in it, and therefore we can take oxygen isotopes from diatoms as well. Now we've been talking about organisms and nodules of certain minerals that have formed in water that have taken oxygen isotopes from the water, but we haven't talked about the water itself. The water itself can actually be pretty well preserved in ice cores. Ice in its solid form is a mineral. And through taking these cores, we can measure the oxygen isotopes straight from the frozen water molecules and understand the ratios from the water that formed that ice. And we can measure past timing because like sediment, ice forms in layers because it's just snow literally raining down, just like sediment is. On the very left, there's a sediment core that shows varves, which are just layers of fine sediment that shows seasonal or annual variation. And so like this, we can look at the layers in ice cores that also show seasonal variation, and we can use the isotope ratios within each layer to understand the climate during that time. And we'll talk about hydrogen in a different isotope video because we can also use deuterium to hydrogen ratios. Ice cores aren't only useful for their frozen water molecules, but also for the air bubbles that they trap in their ice. So not only can we use oxygen and hydrogen ratios in ice cores, but also carbon. And from this, we can understand something about the atmosphere during the time at which that ice was accumulating. And not only are air bubbles found in ice, but also in amber. Amber has been great for preserving some amazing fossil specimens, but it also can preserve air. Just like the ice, it can trap air bubbles in its structure, and we can extract the air and measure its composition. In addition, there are other proxies in which we use fossilized pollen or microscopic algae, such as the species we already talked about. And this study is called palynology, and we'll talk about both air bubbles and palynology more in the carbon isotope lecture. Lastly, I wanted to mention a couple more really strong proxies that we use, such as dendrochronology or using tree rings to not only age trees, which is what dendrochronology is, but also to understand the carbon isotopic signatures in those tree rings because those represent carbon from the atmosphere. And this is because plants build themselves with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now they convert it to organic carbon before they actually build themselves, but the carbon is the same. And the isotopes of the carbon we can measure. And we'll talk about this more in the carbon isotope lecture, as well as using morphology or shape and structure of leaves and carbon isotope signatures in other plant fossils in the carbon isotope lecture as well. And we use all these proxies because of the knowledge that we have of Earth's modern system. For example, we can use the morphology of leaves to understand past climates because we know that leaves with smoother edges grow in certain climates and leaves with spikier edges grow in certain climates and broader leaves grow in certain climates and thinner or needle-like leaves grow in certain climates. And we know that throughout the modern system and we figured out why they do that. And it all has to do with the climate and the nutrients available and the environment as a whole. And that's why we can use certain things as environmental and paleoclimate proxies is because we have have such knowledge of the modern system. So why not use it to understand Earth's history? It's just an amazing field of study. I mean, all of these are very different fields of study, but they all go back to the same thing. And it's understanding where we came from and how Earth works and how it has evolved through time. And that to me is super amazing. With that, thank you so much for watching. And I can't wait to see you for all the other isotope lectures. Bye.